Thank you. It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My, uh, my question uh, to the Premier. Um, Premier, later today we will learn a little bit more about what you and Dalton McGuinty have been working so hard to hide these last three years. We know that you and Dalton McGuinty made a snap decision to cancel gas plants with no thought whatsoever uh, over their cost, the analysis on the damage it does to our reputation, our hydro system, the lost jobs. You sometimes seem to pretend that you once met Dalton McGuinty at a cocktail party, that you once maybe crossed his paths at a federal convention. Worry, Nobody believes that. We know that you were the co-chair of the campaign. You know where you were at the Premier's right hand when this decision was made. You signed off at Cabinet the document authorizing the cancellation of this gas plant. So, Premier, can you tell us once and for all, if you signed the document, if you made the decision, if you made the call, Question. how can you claim you knew nothing about this project to begin with? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, let me just say that, uh, to the contrary of what the Leader of the Opposition has said, Mr. Speaker, I have done everything in my power to make sure that every question that has been asked has received an answer, Mr. Speaker. That's why 160,000 pages of documentation have been provided to the committee, Mr. Speaker. That's why we broadened the we moved to broaden the scope of the committee, Mr. Speaker. That's why 62 witnesses have been able to go to the committee and answer questions. I said from the moment that I came into this job that I wanted to make sure that there was an open process, that there, where there were questions, that those questions would be answered, Mr. Speaker. I'm not going to preempt the release of the report by the Auditor General. She will release her report this afternoon, and we will have the discussion that will ensue from that, Mr. Speaker. But our objective has been to open up the information and provide that information to everyone who's been asking questions, Mr. Speaker. Leaders take responsibility, Premier, and leaders take action. Nobody's been fired, nobody's released from the job. You actually promoted the people behind this into higher positions in your cabinet. You've actually given the green light for more. And the problem is this approach, this scandal approach that puts the interests of the Liberal Party ahead of the interests of hardworking Ontario taxpayers every time continues. We've seen it with eHealth. We've seen it with Orange. We've seen it with the Win McGinty cover-up on the gas plan scandal. And withdraw, please. Now with the Pan Am Games scandal, the half million dollars grant to one of the largest entertainment companies in Canada to the NBA officer, this abject waste and abuse of taxpayer dollars to advance the Liberal interest, Premier, Question. enough is enough. When is this going to come to an end? Okay. Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My responsibility and my job is to advance the interests of the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Whether that means, whether that means providing information when questions are asked by the opposition, we have done that, Mr. Speaker. It's all about me asking for quiet. Yes, it is. The member from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex, will come to order. I have been very clear, Mr. Speaker, that I take responsibility for mistakes that were made. I have apologized, and I apologize for mistakes that were made in terms of the siting of those gas plants, Mr. Speaker. But the reality is that every party in this legislature. The member from Kent, Lambton, Kent, Middlesex will come to order second time. Every party in this legislature agreed that those gas plants should be relocated. I would also say, Mr. Speaker, that every party in this legislature agreed that getting the Pan Am Games would be a good thing for Ontario. John Tory and Howard Hampton Answer. wrote letters of support. They thought it was a good thing to have the Pan Am Games, Mr. Speaker. Apparently, the current leaders don't agree, but I think having the Pan Am Games in Ontario and the legacy that will sue is a good thing. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, well, Premier, it's, it's pretty basic. I mean, if my daughter, who turned six last week, apologizes, <laughs> if, she, if she apologizes but then does the same thing over and over again, she's learned no lesson. And the problem is your apology is empty when we see the same scandals erupting with the Pan Am Games, with the grant of a half million for the 
uh, NBA All-Star game. And, and these, these attempts to put the Liberal Party ahead of ordinary, hard-working taxpayers have real-world consequences. Today at City Hall in Toronto, they're debating whether they can actually fund the new subway to Scarborough because this billion dollars that you blew in the gas plans could have completed that project. It could have created jobs in the province of Ontario. It could have relieved gridlock. But instead, he decided to blow a billion dollars on saving two Liberal seats. Premier, you've Question. learned no lesson. The cover-up continues. When is this all going to come to an end? Withdraw, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, first of all, happy birthday to Miller. <laughs> she had a lovely day. And uh, I would say, Mr. Speaker, that it is absolutely critical that government learn from mistakes that are made. And, and Mr. Speaker, that is what I have said all along. That's why we have a new process in place for citing energy infrastructure. It's very important that we learn. I would suggest, Mr. Speaker, that talking about the creation of 26,000 jobs by bringing the Pan Am Games to Ontario, Mr. Speaker, something we all agreed in this House was a good thing, Mr. Speaker. The legacy, the legacy of, of, of uh, the member from Renfrew will come to order, in case you didn't hear me the first time, and he knows why I'm not happy with what he said. Carry on. The legacy of sports venues that we will have in this province that will allow athletes for generations to come to be able to train, Mr. Speaker, those are very, very good yes, things. Sir. And I am proud of the reality that we won the games, that the games are going to be here, and they're going to be a great success, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. The member from the PN Carleton. Thanks very much, uh, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. You admitted cancelling the Oakville gas plant was a political decision. You told this assembly that the cost, the final price tag, would be $40 Order. million. Dollars. Her hand-picked OPA said that that number was spectacularly wrong, and it was actually $310 wow. million. Dollars. She was forced yesterday to acknowledge that, quote, the costs were unacceptably high. And then today we learned in the Globe and Mail that there would be no costs at all had it not been a political decision. Wow. So we are left to draw two conclusions, Speaker. Premier, when you signed the Cabinet document cancelling the Oakville power plant, uh, is it fair to say that you were either so far in over your head you didn't understand what those costs actually were, or did you mislead this House all along that it was more than $40 million? First, uh, first, I'm standing, your mic's not on, so when I finish, then you can stand. The member will withdraw, but before she stands, I'm going to tell everybody I sense there's a trend coming, and if it's going to happen, I'm going to pass questions. Uh, speaker, back to, to the Premier. Uh, withdraw. She's going to answer. Okay. Now it's time for an answer. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So uh, I will just be clear once again that uh, how we got here. Our government, the government, listened to the uh, advice of experts, cited two power plants over the objections of local residents, which yeah. was something that shouldn't have happened, Mr. Speaker. Over time, it became evident that the concerns of the, uh, of the residents were, in fact, legitimate and we needed to uh, make a change. The government listened to those concerns, cancelled cancelled the power plants for relocation elsewhere. Everyone agreed, the PCs agreed, the NDP agreed, Mr. Speaker. The estimates of the cost varied, but Mr. Speaker, all of them, and I've said this, were unacceptably high, that that money should not have been uh, spent in that way. Everything, though, that we did, Mr. Speaker, in the run-up to and uh, in the process yes, of cancelling was uh, the advice that we got was that uh, if we had waited longer, that uh, it could have been much more expensive. Thank so you. that is the reality of what was happening at Thank that you. time. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Back to the Premier. A government without credibility certainly has no legitimacy, and this government has lost all credibility on the Oakville gas plant cancellation and in their entire long-term energy plan. It is clear that the Premier has uh, told us false numbers in this House all along. The Premier has admitted that the cancellation was a political I, uh, Stop the clock for me. While I have both uh, groups uh, deciding how I'm going to judge and rule on language in this place, I'll make the, the judgments on that. 
I'm going to caution the member that I do not like the idea that we're trying to find ways to say something that we're not supposed to say directly. We're trying to find an indirect way to say it. I caution the member last warning. The Premier has told this House n numbers on various occasions that have been debunked outside this House, Speaker. The reality is they made a political decision. The Globe and Mail has acknowledged that today, and she insults every single Ontarian when she says, and I quote, I really feel that my responsibility is to make sure this doesn't happen again. Talk about a deathbed conversion. She was the one who cancelled the plan. She signed the document, and she was the one who sat at the Cabinet table. So, Premier, will you finally admit in this House today that you knew all along that that $40 million was wrong, and you made a proud political decision to save the Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, it is very important that governments learn from mistakes that are made. So, for example, I think, I think it's very important. So, for example, Mr. Speaker, when a subway tunnel is built, Mr. Speaker, and is filled in, it's very important that governments learn that that's not a good idea and that, in fact, sets back transit building, Mr. Speaker. When an asset like a, a public highway, like the 407, is so just as I was attempting to bring attention to the opposition for its loud, boisterous voices, I will do so with the government benches in the name of the Minister of Rural Ontario and the uh, Attorney General, along with those on the other side who are doing the same. Finish, please. When, for example, an asset like the 407 is sold, it's very important, Mr. Speaker, that governments and future governments learn from those kinds of decisions and mistakes. When these gas plants were relocated, Mr. Speaker, I have said over and over again, and I continue to say, that there were mistakes made. There were things that happened that should not have happened. I take responsibility for those, and my Thank responsibility you. is to make sure that they do not happen again. Final supplementary. If I had sent for every single time a Liberal on that side of the House stood up and said it's not going to happen again after Orange, after eHealth, after OLG, after Pan Am, after, after, after every scandal. Speaker, I could afford a power plant in Oakville. But, Speaker, for years my party has been calling, or for months, for a judicial inquiry into this, but we now know that you will go to any length to suppress the truth and obscure the truth and ensure that we don't receive all of the true numbers. You have obstructed us. No, no, no. That, that, uh, that does go over the line, so I'll ask the member to withdraw. And if you do not redirect it in any other way, then I'm passing. Sure, Speaker. Uh, my question. Withdraw. Withdrawn. Premier, given that the two glass plants uh, cancellations have now become the largest political scandal in Ontario's history, where hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayer money was abused in order to save liberal states, will you finally admit today that you have orchestrated a scheme that out performs the federal sponsorship scandal and that you have ensured that the people of this province Thank are going you. to be paying well into the future? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Premier. Mr. Speaker, I wrote to the Auditor General. I asked her, I asked the Auditor General of the day to look at the Oakville situation. I met with the Auditor General yesterday, Mr. Speaker. I have done everything in my power to make sure that the information that was asked for has been made available to those who have asked, Mr. Speaker. I have opened up the process because I believe that it is our responsibility to learn from decisions that were made and make sure that those decisions, were they wrong-headed, are not repeated in the future, Mr. Speaker. I believe that that is our responsibility. But the bottom line, Mr. Speaker, on energy in this province is when we came into office, there was not a reliable transmission grid, Mr. Speaker. There was not reliable generation. We have cleaned that up. We are closing the coal-fired plants, Mr. Answer. Speaker. People in this province can depend on energy. They can depend on transmission. It's clean. It's renewable. And we have Thank turned you. the corner on the fiasco Thank that was left by the Be seated, please. Be seated, please. New question, the leader of the third party. 
Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. In 2010, the Liberal government, in which the Premier proudly served, cancelled a private power contract in Oakville, a contract, in fact, that they had just signed months before. And on October 18, 2010, the Minister of Energy said, and I quote, the costs, if there are any at all, will not even be close to the uh, fear-mongering numbers, unquote. Does the Premier still stand by her government's comments in 2010? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, one of the one of the issues about this whole discussion has been the degree to which the numbers have varied, and that there has been uncertainty in the advice that has been given to us repeatedly, Mr. Speaker. Every time that we have spoken in the House, we have spoken. I have spoken with the numbers that I have been given, Mr. Speaker, whether it's in 2010, 2011, or today, Mr. Speaker. But the reality is that the numbers have varied, and I think that that will that is the that is the case. That is the reality that we're dealing with, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, it has been a challenge to get a handle on exactly what the numbers are. So that is why I asked the Auditor General yes. to look at the situation. I asked her to give us a, 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 an overview of the situation as she saw it, and that is what we Answer. will hear today, Mr. Speaker, when she releases her report at three o'clock. Thank you, Supplementary. Well, Speaker, with all due respect, it hasn't been the numbers that have been varying. It's been the information the Liberals have been able to give to the public that's been varying every single time. For two years, the government refused to disclose information pertaining to the cost of cancelling the private power deal, blocking freedom of information requests and dodging questions in this House. They signed the contract. They cancelled it, but they refused to share the facts with the people of Ontario who would be paying the bill, Speaker. At one point, the Minister of Energy told me, and I quote, We'll be happy to share the results of the discussions with TransCanada when they're done. We're confident they'll result in a good solution for everyone. Does the Premier think that her government delivered a good solution for everyone, Speaker? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I think I've been very clear that I haven't thought this process has been a good one at all. I said, Mr. Speaker, that from the outset there should have been a better process in the siting of the gas plants. Since I have been in this office, I have opened up the process, Mr. Speaker. We broadened the, the, the scope of the committee. We've provided 160,000 documents, Mr. Speaker and provide an opportunity for all the questions that the opposition members had for those questions to be answered. The important piece right now, Mr. Speaker, is that we listen to what the Auditor General says, that we make sure that the policies that we put in place going forward address the concerns, address the issues, and address the mistakes that were made. That is our responsibility. That is what we'll do. Answer, Mr. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, after the election, when the government finally grudgingly admitted to the public would be on the hook for the Liberal Party's crass decision, the member from Don Valley West, the current Premier, said, and I quote, the total cost of the re relocation is $40 million. Now, does the Premier stand by her own assumption, or assertion rather, that the total cost, cost of this crass political move would be $40 million? Wow. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Again, those are the sunk costs, and those are the costs that are not retrievable and are not paying for any future benefit, and I think the leader of the third party knows that, and I do stand by that number, Mr. Speaker, but I have just said that the, uh, the numbers have varied, that there have been other costs that have been included, and that is what the Auditor General will clarify today, Mr. Speaker. But the, the fact is that we have opened up the process, and in terms of the information that's available, we have worked very hard to make sure that everything that has been asked Member for from has Bruce been Rio provided. That's Tumble why 160,000 documents have been provided. That's why 62 witnesses have, in 93 hours of testimony, Mr. Speaker, have gone before the committee to answer all of those questions because we opened up the process. Yeah. New question, Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also to the Premier. People know what's going to happen today, Speaker. The Premier will say sorry again and declare it's time to turn the page. But the only reason that we are on this page is because at every single step of this saga, the government put the Liberal Party's interests first, and the people stuck paying the bills were an afterthought. Now, does the Premier really think that the government deserves credit when they fought against transparency and accountability, accountability relentlessly for years. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, I have fought for transparency. Yes. I have, since I have been in this office and, and throughout the run-up to the leadership, I said, Mr. Speaker, that it was absolutely imperative that we open up the process and that we provide information, and that's what we have done. But just to the to the uh, the leader of the third party's point, in terms of how we got here, Mr. Speaker, I think it is important to remember that there were experts who advised that the, the location of the plants, the gas plants, should be where, uh, where it was originally. The community objected to that, Mr. Speaker, and I think it was at that juncture where the community was objecting, where there were voices being raised, and we did not pay close enough attention. We did not have a process in place that would have taken into account the Answer. concerns of the community. That's where the original mistake was made, Mr. Speaker. That's what we've corrected. That's what can't happen again. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the Premier can try to replay it however she wants. The reality is they signed the contract and just a couple of months later, they cancelled it. Her story does not hold water, Speaker. At every step of this scandal, the Liberal government has put its own political skin first. Transparency, honesty and the people of Ontario were distant afterthoughts for the Liberal government. The Premier now wants credit for calling the Auditor General. But the reason we need the Auditor General in the first place is that at every single step along the way, this Liberal government has put spin, cynical politics and self-interest ahead of Ontarians. Now, does, does the Premier realize that we are here today because her government has never once been up front with the people of Ontario about how much it wasted on the Oakville Question. gas plant? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I guess my question back to the leader of the third party is whether she understands that we've contracted to build 21 gas plants, 19 are up and running. These two, Mr. Speaker, did not, the process did not work as it should have. But our interest is in the interest of having a stable electricity system in this province for the people of Ontario. And my question to the leader of the third party would be, does she understand that? Does she understand the mess that the electricity system was in when we came into office in 2003? And did she have a plan to address that? Order. Stop the clock. Order. Stop the clock. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. The, um Looking for uh, individuals. The member from Renfrew, Nepissing, Pembroke, will come to order. Last time, I am, uh, and the member, and the minister for rural affairs is going to come to order. That's his second time. If uh, anyone chooses to try to outshout me, you'll lose. And any other comments that are made when I'm trying to get control of this place. Final supplementary. Speaker, does the Premier know that every single person in Ontario knows that the difference with these two plants is that they threatened five Liberal seats yes. if they were allowed to go forward? Yes. People in this province, Speaker, are coping with very tough times, and a lot of them are wondering about whether they can hold a job, whether they can pay the bills whether they can find the health care that they need for their loved ones. And they see a government that has not only put the needs of their party ahead of the needs of the public, but that has acted as though people have no right to this information, even though they're the ones that are stuck paying the bill. So, does the Premier understand that when she says sorry yet again today, it sounds like just another piece of empty Liberal spin? Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I, just, I just do not accept the premise of the, the Leader of the Third Party's question, because the fact is I have opened up the process. I have not been trying to hide information. I've been trying to provide information, Mr. Speaker, and I, you know, I really believe I know that people, I know that people are struggling. I know that it is very important that we focus on the economy and that we work to, to work with the private sector to create jobs, Mr. Speaker. I understand that, but I also 
also know that if we don't have a reliable electricity system in the province, Mr. Speaker, and I'm not talking just about the blackout, I'm talking about the state of our transmission, the state of distribution, the state of our renewables, Mr. Speaker. We've worked on all of that since we came into office. We had a plan, we've executed it, and there were two gas plants that the process did not work for, Mr. Speaker. We're changing that. We'll make sure that that doesn't happen again. But we have Thank changed the, turned the corner on the electricity system in this province. Thank you. Any questions? The member from Nipissing. Thank you, Speaker. Good morning. My question is for the Premier. Uh, later today, we'll learn from the Auditor General just how desperate you were to save the uh, Liberal seat in Oakville. We'll learn three years after the cancellation of the gas plant just how much cash you were willing to squeeze from Ontarians to put the Liberal interests ahead of theirs. But you already knew what you were getting us into when you signed the cabinet document that started this whole payment process back in July of 2011. So you either knew the magnitude of this cancellation and what it would mean to families, or you blindly signed a document not caring how much you spent to save that Liberal seat. So which was it, Premier? I don't know or I don't care. Mr. Speaker, I have appeared before the committee. I've been quite clear about what I knew and what I didn't know, Mr. Speaker. What I what I will say again is that we were advised, Mr. Speaker, we were advised that waiting to relocate the plant until after construction had begun could have been much more expensive, Mr. Speaker. So we were doing everything that we could to uh, to mitigate those costs, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that I appeared before committee. I was very clear about my role, which was not central in terms Remember of from Bolton, decision we'll come making, to order. Mr. Speaker. And what what we what we have done since we came into since I've been in this office is to have opened up the process to provide all of that information, and people have come before the committee and have answered the questions of the member opposite repeatedly. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, Speaker, the most astonishing fact is that while many of us spent the last 12 months trying to get to the truth, we still don't know how much it costs to cancel the Oakville plant. The Premier talks about transparency, but 150,000 documents later, they were still able to keep the truth from us. Speaker, You knew last fall, when you tried to pass off $40 million as the amount, that it was much, much more than that. Your energy minister has said $40 million. Other members of your caucus and your cabinet have said $40 million, but we know that number's not true. So, Premier, who are you going to hold accountable over this? Who is going to lose their job? Is it going to be the energy minister, the finance minister, or should it be you, Premier? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Speaker. Oh. You may be surprised at my next comment. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The very reason that I wrote to the Auditor General and asked the Auditor General of the day to look at the Oakville situation, Mr. Speaker, was because there was uh, there was confusion. There were questions about the numbers. The $40 million in sunk costs, Mr. Speaker, was not the whole cost. It was very clear that there was a lot. There were a lot of questions about what the uh, what the total cost was. That's why I asked the Auditor General to look at the situation. That's why we're getting a report today, Mr. Speaker. That's why the Auditor General will be releasing her report, and there will be uh, there will be more light shone on what the uh, what the costs were. Had I not wanted that information out, Mr. Speaker, I wouldn't have asked the Auditor. General General to look at the situation. I did that, opened up the process. That's why we will get the report today, Mr. Thank Speaker. Question? The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Premier. Published reports suggest that this afternoon's Auditor General's report will show that TransCanada would not have been entitled to damages if the government hadn't pulled the plug as part of its seat saver program. These reports say that because of opposition from both the township of Oakville and of residents, that TransCanada would likely never have gotten a shovel in the ground and the contract would have terminated on its own. Why did this government waste hundreds of millions of dollars cancelling the Oakville plant when it had no legal obligation to do so? I'll send it. Oh, sorry. Um, government House Leader. Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the, 
I think the first point is that we should wait for the Auditor General's exactly. report to come out this afternoon. Exactly. So the second point, Mr. Speaker, is there has been testimony in front of committee about the situation in Oakville and the efforts that were being made both by the municipality and by uh, the power plants. But more importantly, Mr. Speaker, perhaps the Honourable Member in his supplementary wants to explain his opposition to this very plan. Maybe he wants to explain why he told Inside Hall on October 7, 2010, I don't agree with the Oakville Power Plan. I don't think it's necessary. Perhaps he wants to talk about why the member from Beaches East York, his colleague, said, quote, I'm glad that the people of Oakville came to their senses. I'm glad the people of Oakville hired Aaron Brockovich and did all the things that they did That's in it. order to have this killed. Mr. Speaker, it's a bit rich for that member who led the opposition of his party against this Thank plan you. to stand up in that. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, you can tell you got a good question when there's a major dodge going on. <laughs> if, if, if the Oakville contract had simply run its course, it likely would have been terminated due to events beyond the control of TransCanada. The company would have been entitled to no damages under that scenario. But that scenario, Speaker, would have taken several years to unfold. It would have threatened the Liberal seat saver program. How does the government justify a crass political decision to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to save Liberal seats? Mr. Speaker, this is so rich coming from that member. You know, when there was an issue in his own riding with Portland's Energy, a very similar one, this is what, let me quote from the Breaches Riverdale Mirror. Tavins vowed he won't be bound by the Liberal government's plans for his riding, which include constructing the natural gas-fired $700 million, 550 megawatt Portland's Energy Centre at the unused R.L. Hearn Station in partnership with TransCanada Energy. Listen to this quote, everyone. Listen to this quote from the member. This is going to be a political decision, but it needs someone who's going to be a champion for Toronto. Toronto Danforth, he said. Mr. Speaker, it's a little rich that that member could stand here today and ask that question. To a new question, the member from Oak Ridges Market. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Finance. Member from Oak Ridge's Markham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Finance. I know that for many years our government has taken a leadership role among the provinces in promoting the establishment of a common securities regulator for all of Canada. Businesses in Ontario and in my riding of Oak Ridge's Markham have long been concerned that our current system is a patchwork of securities regulators that place unnecessary costs on business and add to the burden of red tape facing their competitiveness. My constituents and businesses in my community are pleased to hear that you have made recent announcements on steps to correct the current system. Can you please provide the House with an update on the establishment of a common securities regulator for all of Canada? Excellent. Thank you, Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, thank you to the member from Oak Ridge's Markham for the question, and she's absolutely correct. Our government has long advocated for and taken leadership in the creation of a cooperative service regulator right here in Canada. A few weeks ago, I was pleased to be joined by my counterparts of the federal government in British Columbia to make that a historic announcement. Together, we'll establish a cooperative regulator. Mr. Speaker, in our last budget, we laid out the framework for such a regulator, and this agreement is based just on that. It will add real benefits to Canadians and to our businesses. It will increase the ability of those businesses to raise capital, and it will allow households to save and invest even more with more confidence. And, of course, in all, it will help create jobs and grow our economy. And, Mr. Speaker, this is important. Toronto and Ontario are home to Canada's largest securities market and regulator. And as long said, that cooperative securities yes, regulator sir. should be based in Toronto. And that's exactly, Mr. Speaker, where it will be. Thank you. 
supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister of Finance for providing that update. I agree that this new regulator is long overdue and will help to ensure Ontario and Canada maintain our competitive advantage and prosper in a globalized world. I know this issue is of special importance to the Minister, as he provided a statement to this Assembly in March of 2010 advocating for a cooperative regulator. Mr. Speaker, given the Minister's recent announcement with British Columbia to establish a cooperative securities regulator, it is essential Ontario continue to lead the Federation in building consensus on this important issue. Mr. Speaker, could the Minister please speak to some of the specifics of this new regulator and how Ontario will engage more provinces in this process? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. While the head office will be based in Toronto, it will be and go to build and respect on the unique strengths across the country by creating regional offices as well. Mr. Speaker, essential to the new cooperative regulator will be this pooling of provincial, territorial, and federal expertise. It will allow Canada as a whole to better compete in the global economy. It will reduce costs, increase efficiencies to capital markets regulation, strengthen the competitiveness of the economy, and attract more investments, but all the while enhancing the reputation of our country's financial services sector, much of which is based here in Ontario. This is what a provincial solution, Mr. Speaker. It's a bottom-up approach, and it's working. This is an historic moment, making all of Canada, as well as Ontario, a more attractive location exactly. for investment. Thank you. New question, the member from York Simple. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and my question is to the Premier. Premier, today the Auditor General will hand down yet another report. This will be the sixth special report from the AG in four years. These six reports on scandals are in direct response to your government's actions. With the e-health report, Premier McGuinty said, we welcome the auditor's report. Six. We accept his findings and we commit to adopting every single one of his recommendations. Oops. With the consultants in health care report, Minister Matthew said, thank you to the auditor general. With the Orange Report, Minister Duncan said, I look forward to the recommendations of the Auditor General. With the Mississauga Gas Plant Cancellation Report, Premier, you said, we welcome his report. Since it's clear Question. you don't have a jobs creation plan, is this your big plan to keep the Auditor employed after thanking her, of course? <laughs> I was waiting for a little bit of meat in that question. I mean, the, the reality is that as the reports come forward and as the recommendations come up. First of all, the member asked the question. I'm sure she wants to hear. And the other members are shouting somebody down, and I don't think that's going to get anywhere. Premier. Of course, Mr. Speaker, when the reports are tabled, um, we appreciate them and we receive them. But the 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 next step is to implement them and that's what we do mr speaker we're implementing the recommendations when i talk about when i talk about the uh the way government has to learn from challenges and mistakes that are made that is about implementing recommendations of the experts who look and say this is what happened and this is what should happen next we've implemented the recommendations mr speaker on orange we're implementing the uh the recommendations on e-health mr speaker and i look forward to the recommendations of the auditor general today thank you Supplementary. The Auditor General's responsibility is to assess the value for money of a government project or program. She asked, did the taxpayers get their money's worth? From the past six reports, the answer is a resounding no. Your government has heard so much advice from the Auditor General, people are left wondering if you rely on the Auditor General's reports as part of your strategic planning. My residents are understandably aghast at the gas plant scandal, and they want your government held accountable for all its actions. How do you explain your record of scathing Auditor General reports to taxpayers? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So here's how government works. Government, any government of any stripe, Mr. Speaker, a government has a plan. We have had a plan. We have implemented our plan, Mr. Speaker, at regular intervals and at sometimes uh, in special reports. The Auditor General and other external officers, Mr. Speaker, will look at what government has 
done and will make recommendations that will improve the process. I think that it is a sign of a strong and intelligent and learning government, Mr. Speaker, that when those reports come forward, when recommendations are made by people who have expert advice, that we can implement changes, Mr. Speaker, and government then can evolve to be more accountable and to do the business of government and the business of the people of the province better, Mr. Speaker. I think that's what government exists to do. It exists to improve the lot of people in the province, to provide services in a way that is rational, that is cost-effective, and yes, there sir. can be recommendations from many sources, including the Auditor General, that can improve those processes. And we look forward to the recommendations of the Auditor General this afternoon. New question, the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the minister responsible for the Pan Am Games. Two weeks ago, I met with workers from Claremont Electric in Hamilton to discuss safety concerns they had about the construction at the Pan Am Stadium. They informed me that they were asked to sign a document permitting non-electrical workers to install electrical equipment, all in the interest of cutting costs. The College of Trades, which this government established, was put in the place to prevent these types of practices. Speaker, does the minister believe that the use of laborers with no specialized training in electrical work is the safest way to install electrical equipment at the Pan Am venues? Minister responsible for Pan Am. Thank you, thank you, Speaker. And this is more to the uh, labor issue, and I want to direct this supplementary to the Minister of Labor. Uh, talk about the capital project on Pan Am Games, uh, Speaker. We are doing a fantastic job uh, up to this point of time. I, I tell you why. You know, the, all the Speaker, all the capital projects, on time, they are on, time on budget, and the early number coming back here is under budget. Under, under budget, Speaker. We are going to, at this point of time, $50 million under budget. So this is a very good news for the Pan Am game. Speaker, we are right now on stage two, which is the operation of the Pan and Para Pan American game. And this week, the uh, international people, they are in town, the Paso, they are in town to celebrate Answer. Pan and Para Pan Man games. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, uh, the safety of the spectators and the athletes who will be using the Pan Am venue should be the minister's primary concern. Unfortunately, the minister has decided to give Pan Am executives lavish bonuses but cut costs by hiring non-electrical workers to do electrical work. Those bonuses will be rolling in, I think. Speaker, will the minister get his priorities straight and put public safety above the perks of Pan Am executives? Minister. Minister of Labour. Mr. Labor. Thank you very much, Speaker. And uh, to the members opposite this question, the health and safety of workers and public uh, is obviously the paramount uh, priority for the government. Speaker, the certification of uh, trades falls under the responsibility of the Ministry of Training Colleges and Universities. However, during the transition period, enforcement of said certification currently falls under the, the Ministry of Labor. The Ministry of Labor inspectors carry out this enforcement during field visits. An inspector visiting any construction project would routinely audit compulsory trades, including electricians, and take enforcement action where a non-licensed person was performing that work of an electrician. In this particular case, Speaker, the Ministry of Labor has visited the site seven different times on different matters to make sure uh, that all rules are complied with. It is our understanding that the College of Trades is aware Answer. of Claremont Electric's concern uh, but no formal complaint has been filed at this file, therefore no ex investigation can be done of the issues that have been raised by the thank member. Thank you. New question. The member from Thunder Bay, Atacoke. Speaker, thank you very much. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Natural Resources. Uh, Minister Atacoke uh, is a community in my riding of Thunder Bay, Atacoke, about two hours west of the city of Thunder Bay. In the day, Atacoke peaked at a population of seven, eight, or 9,000 people, and that population growth was fueled by the creation of two large mines, Steep Rock Iron Mines and Kaland Ore. Unnecessary for the creation of those mines was the creation of a series of earthen dams in and around the area to prevent natural drainage from flowing into those mines. Once the uh, dams were created, the lake was pumped out and the mines were created. Now, one of these earthen dams is called the Hardy Dam. This dam has been the subject of concern since first being identified by the MNR some years ago 
with the potential for some failure. So, Speaker, my question to the minister is simply this. Can the minister describe for the community of Atacogan and for this House what we've done up until this point to ensure the structural integrity of that particular day? Thank you, Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Uh, the member from Thunder Bay, Atacogan, is raising a very important public safety concern in his riding. The Hardy Dam is one of 391 dams that our ministry is responsible for across the province. This year, MNR will allocate uh, $6.25 million to repair and maintain these dams. The dams uh, provide a number of benefits, including controlling flooding and drought, producing hydroelectric power, providing recreational opportunities, and preventing the spread of invasive species. We take the safety of all dams, including the Hardy Dam, very seriously. We've undertaken emergency repairs in response to the sinkholes and seepage issues that have developed at the Hardy Dam site. Since 2000, uh, Four, we have spent over a million dollars on engineering evaluations, repairs, and installing equipment to help monitor the dam. MNR has retained a senior geotechnical engineer to monitor the dam. We have also installed equipment to measure hydrologic pressure inside the dam. The, um, the senior geotechnical engineer will uh, review the data, and we will ensure that uh, there's ongoing monitoring. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank uh, the minister for that response. It's, uh, as he's aware, there is significant political concern from Mayor Brown in Atacokan, from the entire council uh, in Atacokan, about the results if that dam were to, fare, or to fail. Highway 622 is a main artery in Atacokan. That would be compromised. There's a rail spur line that feeds the Ontario generating plant that's now being converted to biomass. That would be compromised. The ski hill would be compromised. But perhaps most importantly, uh, should the dam fail, the infill rates from that failed dam into the old mine site that currently contains significantly contaminated water would raise the rates of infill to the point where that mine site could potentially overflow its banks. That contaminated water could then potentially find its way into the Seine River system. This would be a consequence of international proportions. So, Minister, my question is, thank you for what we've done so far. Uh, can the minister describe for the political leadership of Northern Ontario in Northern Ontario what our plans are on a go-forward basis? Minister. Thank you, uh, Speaker. The member from Thunder Bay, Atacokan, is aware that we uh, are taking immediate steps to ensure public safety with respect to this dam. We're in the process of securing a contract with an engineering firm to repair the dam and reduce uh, water pressure, and funding has been allocated for the project to begin immediately. MNR expects the repair work to extend the dam's operating life by about 10 years, allowing time for a long-term decision on the future of the dam. Monitoring of the dam has been increased to twice daily with regular reports from those on site. We've also established an emergency preparedness plan, which is designed to ensure MNR and its partners are prepared to implement uh, measures should the uh, failure occur. This plan ensures stakeholders are notified and that we'll work together with the emergency Answer. response officials to implement measures to ensure public safety, and we'll continue to work with the community of Atacokan and stakeholders to ensure the long-term stability you. of the dam. Thank you. New question. The member from Barry. Thank you, Speaker. My question today is for the Premier. Premier, it's easy to be generous when you're spending other people's money and you're definitely setting an example. Recently, you defended the $7 million bonus uh, package for TO 2015 executives saying it wasn't out of whack and that public servants uh, receiving 200% of their bloated salary for showing up for work. Then you let 76% of them take advantage of taxpayer money and more by misfiling their expenses. Tomorrow, you're throwing a lavish uh, Pan Am party for $500,000. Wow. Out of respect for the Ontario taxpayer, Premier, the Ontario PC party unanimously agreed not to attend. Premier, are you going to continue to let the entitlement thriver shut these ridiculous completion bonuses down and stop the frivolous spending? Thank you, Premier. Stop the waste. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And as I, uh, as I said in response to an earlier, an earlier question, we bid on the Pan Am Games, Mr. Speaker. The leader of the opposition, the leader of the third party, agreed that it was a good thing to do. That we should, that we should go for it, and we should try to get the Pan Am Games here in, uh, in Ontario. Well, your, your leader, your leader agreed, your leader, Mr. Speaker. Your leader, um, so as the host of the 2015 Games, just to the, uh, the issue of the reception, it's a requirement to hold uh, a General Assembly 
uh, reception uh, to host that that meeting here in the venue where the Pan Am Games are going to be held. And the uh, the host for the next Pan Am Games, Mr. Speaker, will be chosen as a part of that meeting. So it's all part of the package, and we believe that the 26,000 jobs that are going to be created as a result of having the Pan Am bid, the legacy venues, Mr. Speaker, for athletes for generations to come, we believe those are a good thing. It's unfortunate Thank you. that the, uh, the opposition doesn't agree with it. Thank you. Supplementary. Very Premier, practice. no one disagrees that the Pan Am Games are going to be a good thing for Ontario. We've never said anything different than that. The question is, at what cost? And what is the cost? Speaker, I want to be clear that the Pan Parapan American Games are about our province and about our athletes. Yet the average income for a high performance athlete in the Pan Am level is $29,000, rather, $10,000 less than the average Canadian personal income. More tellingly, it is $450,000 less than the Pan Am CEO, who's definitely wow. taking home the gold wow. there. Wow. Uh, and that doesn't include the 200% bonus uh, just for showing up for work, or the unlimited expense account, or the world-class partying, or the countless other perks that we're still learning about. Premier, is prolific spending a new Pan Am sport? Ho -ho. Thank, you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So the reality is that in order to be able to have gotten these games, we had to compete with cities around the, the Americas, Mr. Speaker. In order to get the Pan Parapan Games, we had to put in place a competitive bid, Mr. Speaker. Part of that competitive bid was having in place a secretary and having in place a compensation package that would bring people in who would run the games, Mr. Speaker, the caliber of which would have competed with the other cities, Mr. Speaker. That's the reality. I'm not defending particular compensation packages, Mr. Speaker. What I'm defending is the notion that we would have the Pan Parapan Games, that it's a good thing for the province, Mr. Speaker. Is the, uh, is the member from Renfrew tired yet? And I'm, and I'm wondering if the uh, member from Prince Edward Hastings is. You have 10 seconds. Mr. Speaker, these compensation packages are similar to, they're based on the officials from Vancouver 2010, the London 2012 Olympic Games, Mr. Speaker. Successful Thank events. You. This is the largest multi sport event ever held in Canada. That's 10 seconds. New question, the member from Beaches East York. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, I met with mayors from the Niagara region. The lack of convenient and affordable regional transit was raised by them. The fact that there is a summer-only, weekend-only GO trains to and from St. Catharines and Niagara Falls, but not a single weekday train for Niagara commuters who need to get to work in Hamilton, Burlington or Toronto. How is it that this government has hundreds of millions of dollars to move gas plants and protect its own interests, but no money to put in place year-round daily GO train service between Toronto and Niagara Region? Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. You know, I, 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 have, I, I really enjoy the third party, Mr. Speaker, because they're never crass or political, and unlike all the other parties oh, in the House, principle. they're they above politics, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, it was like we, Mr. Speaker, we listened. We, we listened to questions about Windsor and London for some reason last session, Mr. Speaker, and now they've discovered Niagara Region. Uh, uh, someone bought them a new map, Mr. Speaker. I, I'm so glad these are not politically motivated questions, because you people never do that. You're not politicians. Mr. Speaker, we have expanded track. We are building a new station in Hamilton. We, we now have the GO Bike Service. We're working with Mayor Diodati to put unprecedented levels of transit investment. We're very well aware of that agenda, and we're still making up for cuts Answer. for the two parties opposite when they were in government, Mr. Speaker. But I'm glad the member opposite has a map of Ontario now. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that very insulting answer. The people of Niagara Region and the commuters would take GO Transit and avoid congested highways if there was reasonable GO service. Instead, the Liberal government expects Niagara Falls and St. Catharines residents to wait up to 90 minutes for a weekday morning GO bus. That's not feasible for busy families with many demands. 
instead of spending hundreds of million dollars on its own interests, why won't the government invest in the needs of Niagara residents and commit now to a delivery date for all-day go, go train service to Niagara? The mayors want to know. And so <coughs> Excuse me. I'd like to ask the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek uh, not to heckle when your member was asking a question. Answer, please. Th thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. It is uh, one of my partners' I favorite uh, activities is getting our trains on the uh, on the uh, on the bike trains that go to Niagara and doing the well and loop. It's an amazing experience, uh, and we're very proud of that. Mr. Speaker, we have $507 million going right now as part of a $602 million investment in highway infrastructure right now in Niagara Region. We have put $54.4 million into transit in the Niagara Region. Highway infrastructure right now, as I said, $602, and we've invested $34.4 in uh, roads and uh, municipal infrastructure related to transportation. We're making major investments right now in buying track from CN. Answer. Uh, and an expanding track capacity, and we're working with the municipalities to improve highway, local transit at an unprecedented Thank level. You. We're proud of that record, Mr. Speaker. New Thank question, you. The from Prescott, Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Speaker, our economic plan is investing in people, it's in investing in infrastructure, it's creating the right business climate for job creation right here in Ontario. During my time as a municipal mayor, and now as I serve the constituents of Glengarry Prescott Russell as their MPP, jobs in the economy continue to be a priority in the discussions that I have with them on a regular basis. I know that our government has made some tremendous strides in rural Ontario through our regional economic development funds. And I would ask the minister if he could provide this house with an update on how the funds uh, are, are being allocated and how are they creating jobs across this province? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the member for this important question. Mr. Speaker, this week marks the one year anniversary of the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund, a fund that has already helped to create and retain more than 6,300 jobs across southwestern Ontario, over $25 million of government investment, and it's leveraged nearly a quarter of a billion dollars, Mr. Speaker, in private sector investment. Jobs in great places like Middlesex County, Breslau, Elmira, Tilsonburg, Cambridge, Wallaceburg, Guelph, Palmerston, Woodstock, and Brantford, Mr. Speaker, and in eastern Ontario, 12 company expansions in Stormont, Dundas, Glengarry, 11 in Northumberland, Quinty West, six projects in Leeds, Grenville, 11 in Prince Edward, Hastings. These four sets of investments in eastern Ontario alone Answer. contribute more than 40 million of economic growth in eastern Ontario. Both funds have secured over 19,000 jobs since their inception, Thank you. Mr. Speaker, with many more to come. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for the update, and thanks for all the good work you do on behalf of Ontarians. It's great to hear that the work of our government is facilitating to help create jobs and to stimulate the economy. Coming from a rural riding, I know what may work in Toronto might not work in rural Ontario. But as, as we're all under one umbrella, we're all one Ontario. And when it comes to job creation in this province, we all stand to benefit from the economic growth throughout the province. Speaker, our government is creating the right economic climate for businesses while supporting them across this province. And I ask the minister to provide this house as to what specific action are we taking to help businesses stay and grow right here in Ontario. Well, thank you again, Mr. Speaker. I'm happy to speak about what else we're doing for businesses across the province. And on top of the $88 million that we've committed so far through our regional funds, we're also supporting businesses in a number of important ways. Mr. Speaker, in the last five years, we've eliminated 80,000 regulatory requirements for business. That's a 17 percent reduction. We've uh, extended the accelerated capital cost allowance uh, for the purchase of machinery, Mr. Speaker. We've recently announced a three-year, 25 
$5 million social enterprise uh, uh, initiative to help build that sector in Ontario. We'll very shortly be rolling out three additional funds targeting our youth, valued at $100 million, Mr. Speaker. And our, of course, we uh, introduced legislation yes, supporting Small Businesses Act, which will uh, increase the exemption threshold uh, for employees, uh, employers that have to play the youth. Thank, you. The Thank you, Mr. Question. Speaker. The member from Halliburton, Fortha Lakes Rock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Last Monday, on September 30th, your government quietly gave a very generous grant in the amount of $500,000 to Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, a multi-billion dollar company, to help host the, NBA, the 2016 NBA All-Star Game. The grant was part of the Celebrate Ontario initiative that is supposed to help draw tourists for events that may not have the ability to do so without government assistance. To think that the MLSE could not host this event without a grant is ludicrous and an insult to the taxpayers who can't afford to see the game. How many Raptors tickets Question. for this $500,000 grant buy for you and your Liberal colleagues? Oh. And I'll provide the technical fouls to go along with it. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to give the supplementary to the Minister of Tourism who's doing an outstanding job of, a, of attracting an NBA All-Star game that has never occurred in the 65 history. It's all been in the United States. It's coming to Canada. The individuals across the aisle don't seem to appreciate that it's not the amount of money that's being invested, but it's the amount of money that's going to be earned, $95 million coming to the province of Ontario that never would have been possible if the Minister of Tourism didn't take the leadership to attract him here in the first place, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Unbelievable. You can't defend the indefensible. You didn't recognize the Speaker. It's my time. Okay. Um, well, we all know the NBA game was going to come here, whether your government gave money or not. It's ludicrous to say that. <laughs> as to why the Liberals feel the need to keep handing out taxpayers' money. I'm sure my fellow members of Parliament do not forget the scandal of 2007 when the Ontario Cricket Association received $1 million from the Liberal government when it only had asked for $150,000. For a decade, this Liberal government has wasted hundreds of millions and billions of taxpayers' dollars on debacles such as gas plants, Orange, Green Energy Act and eHealth. This is the same old pattern as under Dalton McGuinty. When will the abuse of taxpayers' money stop? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Minister of Finance. <laughs> Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Culture and Sport, Mr. Speaker. I'm quite surprised the member opposite was silent when we supported the NHL All-Star Game 2012 in Ottawa. She was silent when we support the Grey Cup game last year in Toronto. Speaker, it's a good thing to do. Look at this uh, economic benefit. Speaker, it will be 100,000 people watching the game come 2016. It would attract 75,000 tourists and 30,000 overnight visitors coming to town. Speaker, the NBA All-Star Game will broadcast to 214 countries. Total audience is, God, 200 million. Also, 1,800 media members coming to town. One more time. It's a good Thank you. New question. Member from Park Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Parkdale Community Information Centre in my riding was one of many centres across the province notified of funding cuts to pay equity funds. Worse, these funding cuts were applied retroactively 
to last April 2013. For the Parkdale Centre, that is thousands and thousands of dollars in cuts midway into the budget year that they had absolutely no chance to plan for. Why is this government creating turmoil in these centres and taking away funds they have already promised while spending millions in perks for Pan Am execs? Wow. Thank you. Minister of Culture, Tourism and Sport. Speaker, I think the member opposite was talking about a singular matter that I'm not familiar with, and I would uh, get back to her to uh, get more information on uh, the matter she's talking about. She In terms of Pan Am game, we talk. Uh, oh, this is a fantastic uh, time to celebrate the Pan Am game because the international guests they in town this week uh, for the AGM, and also to pick and choose the next. Pan and Para Pan Am game in, uh, in uh, I think it's 2019. So uh, again, you know, uh, the Pan Am game right now, the Capital Corp project is all on time, on budget or under budget of $15 million. Thank you, Speaker. The Speaker and the Speaker's gallery today, I have guests from the riding of Brant, David Hill, Mike Ellis, Aaron Hill, Mary McGee, Julia Guiga and Scott Smith. I'd like to welcome them here to please mark them for the video. I'll entertain it. Uh, in the West uh, Members Gallery, uh, Judy, Mark, and uh, Justin Lai, who are uh, brother and mother of uh, Megan Lai, one of our pages here in the legislature today. We have a deferred vote on the motion, a second reading of Bill 60, an act to strengthen consumer protection with respect to consumer agreements relating to wireless services assessed from the cellular phone, smartphones, or any other similar mobile device. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
The members take their seats, please. All members take their seats. All members take your seats, please. On September the 10th, Ms. McCharles moves second reading of Bill Number 60. All those in favour, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Malloy. Mr. Malloy. Mr. Gerritsen. Mr. Gerritsen. Ms. Jeffrey. Ms. Jeffrey. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Berard Nettie. Mr. Berard Nettie. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Ms. Cansfield. Ms. Cansfield. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Ms. Peruzza. Ms. Peruzza. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mr. McNeely. Mr. McNeely. Mr. Caudry. Mr. Caudry. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Couteau. Mr. Couteau. Mr. 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 Nackney. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Balkison. Mr. Balkison. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. De Ms. Damerler. Ms. Damerler. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Ms. Elliott. Mrs. Elliott. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Miller Perry Salmasco. Mr. Miller Perry Salmasco. Mr. Cleese. Mr. Cleese. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Halliday. Mr. Halliday. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Ms. Chud Mr. Chudley. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Ms. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Sherman. Mr. Sherman. Mr. Yura. Mr. Yura. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Leone. Mr. Leone. Mr. Petapiece. Mr. Petapiece. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Ms. De Novo. Ms. De Novo. Mr. Marchese. Mr. Marchese. Madame Gelina. Madame Gelina. Ms. Mr. Prue. Mr. Prue. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Ms. D Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Shine. Mr. Shine. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Mr. Hat. Mr. Hatfield. Hatfield. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. being 97 and the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Second reading of the bill, deuxième lecture, projet de loi. Pursuant to the order of the House dated October the 3rd, 2013, the bill is referred to the Standing Committee on General Government. There are no further votes. This House stands adjourned until 3 p.m. this afternoon.